welcome back. Thanks for coming back again. It's good to see you and great to be able to share a few lessons that I've learned over my journey in the workplace walking with God. Last session, we talked about work to create the honor and privilege of being able to plug into heaven and download that wisdom and innovation and creativity that's so much a part of our heavenly father. And he wants to bless us. And as we walk with him, he gives us those insights. We search and wrestle with those things. We get creativity, innovation, and we can reconcile and move in ministries of reconciliation and restoration. I'll be salt and light wherever we are. This session, I'm gonna talk about work to worship. Two words not often used in the same sentence, it has to be said, but work can be worship. I'm gonna take you right back to the 17th century, to the bottom of a monastery with a guy called Nick Herman. You might know him as Brother Lawrence. He's a great, great writer and he's venerated in the Christian tradition as a man who really spent time learning to practice the presence of God. He was the, the least of the least in this monastery, the bottom of the monkdom, if there's such a thing as that. He was down in the monastery, washing the dishes, doing the mundane. He spent his entire career just serving the other monks, but he did something quite extraordinary. He learned how to practice the presence of God. He found worship in the most mundane tasks in the washing up and just even picking up things and doing things around the monastery, serving other people, he practiced the presence of God. And he was interviewed, there were some conversations written down and he wrote some letters and that collection has become part of Christian history and he's been honor, honored and venerated for his thinking around practicing that presence of God and finding worshipfulness in the midst of his daily work. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, do it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. What a great thing. Whatever you do, whatever you are doing, do it with all your heart as working for the Lord. He's interested in your work. He's interested in what you do. And as we explore this whole thing of worship today, I'm going to repeat some of the things that we've said we're going to do and ways that we can impact work and purposes for work from the last few sessions. Because worshipfulness is not necessarily what you do. It's more about how you do it and the position of your heart when you do it. If you think about it, if you go into a place of worship and you want to worship God, what do you do? You open up your heart. It's a position of your heart before God. You want to worship Him and give Him glory and give Him honor. It's a position of submission. It's a position of awe and thankfulness before him. So as we go about our work, if we do that in a way that honors him, if we do that with a heart position that says, Lord, I just want to worship you and serve you and be obedient to you. That is work as worship. There's a Hebrew word, avadar, and it describes the worship in heaven, the four creatures around the throne. We're talking about high worship. Worship for worship at the very throne room of God, Avodah. It also has a second meaning. The second meaning is work. Really? Worship and work having the same words, so interconnected, so much of the same thing that in Hebrew it's the same word. I think we've lost something. I think we've separated things between the secular and sacred. We've divided those things so much that we've come to think of work and worship as almost divine opposites. And yet here we have one word in Hebrew to describe work and worship, the same thing, the same word describing the same thing. Work is worship. As we surrender our lives to the Lord in a work context and understand that he's, he's there and he's interested, we can position our hearts in a worshipful manner. As we move at work in humility and in obedience, that is worshipful because our heart position is right before him. Take the difference between Saul and David. We get a certain anointing for the position that we have. If God has promoted us and placed us in a position, we have an anointing for that. We can operate in that way. And as we move into that position, 
God gives us and equips us and gives us something to be able to work in that position. But there's another way. There's something better than that. And David had that. Saul was anointed because of his position. David was anointed because of his heart position. David had a heart after God, as the word says. And that position gave him not only anointing for his for his worldly position as king, but also from his heart position. That's a worshipful approach. And you read the Psalms, you hear the heart of the man of God really digging in, sometimes saying, God, what's going on? Good times, bad times, times when he had to persevere, times when he was suffering, and yet great victories, great breakthroughs for God, ups and downs. And I know what that's like. I've had great highs and great lows, but all the time God has been faithful. And we're anointed because of our heart position if we take work as worship. It's all about our heart. It's all about the attitude that we bring, the position of ourselves before God. There's a word in my walk with God that you know, sometimes carries the wrong connotations, obedience. And we do need to be obedient to the Lord. And Jesus said that we're no longer servants, we're friends. So our obedience comes out of a relationship with him, a wanting to please him. We don't have to work for any righteousness. We're never going to be more righteous than we are right now. We, our righteousness comes through faith with Jesus. We're already seated in heavenly places in him, the word says. But we need to be obedient to what he's saying. If you want to grow, if we want to have the influence, if we want to be used by him in more and more powerful ways to, have, to be impacting the kingdom of God for him. And that's born out of relationship, but it's also born out of a heart position, which says, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I do? Being obedient to him. In John, he equates love with obedience. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And it's true. If we love the Lord with all our heart, mind and soul, we will do what he asks us to do. We'll be obedient to him. But we need to hear to be obedient. And to hear, we need to open our heart, understand that God's walking with us every day at work and position ourselves to receive and to hear from him. Work is worship. Sometimes things don't go well. We have times and seasons where we just have to persevere in submission, as I've talked about before. And in those times, it's worshipful to just persevere, to just stand in the wind, stand at the prow of the ship, and just head into that wind and just take it on the nose and keep going and persevere. And there's something worshipful in that perseverance. As we surrender and submit to him, one of the sessions I talked about work to grow, how we get shaped and transformed. Again, there's a worshipful position of our heart that helps us be transformed as we listen to the Lord. Sometimes in those seasons, you've just got to keep going and persevere. And that's worshipful. I think that's a sacrifice that comes up before the Lord and something that he, that he values highly. I probably should have mentioned this before, but I'm no theologian. I'm certainly not an educator. But I've learned things in the commercial realities of the real world and my walk with God has been completely entwined with my commercial experience. When I gave my life to the Lord, I gave it wholeheartedly. In every aspect of my life, I yielded to Him. Learned a lot over the, over the many years, but there's no separation for me between my work and worship. It's integrated. It's part of the same experience. My walk with God affects all the different areas of my life. And not being a theologian, I discovered something which I thought was interesting. In theology, there's a law of first occurrence, a law of first principle. When something is mentioned in the Bible the first time, it actually sets the template for the interpretation of that occurrence through the rest of the Bible. This is a principle and happens in a lot of different ways. The one that interests me was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's such an important thing. God comes to dwell right in the spirit of man. That's, that's an incredible privilege to have God with us. We experience that as Christians, but it was very rare in the Old Testament for that to happen. So who was it? Who was the first one to be infilled with the Holy Spirit? Was it a priest? That would make sense. The Holy of Holies, the priest, that's a holy thing. That's a sacred thing, infilling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe a king to rule and to be equipped to rule a nation for God. That would, be a, that would make sense. 
It was neither of the above. The first infilling of the Holy Spirit was a craftsman, a worker, a carpenter, a chippy, as we call them here in Australia. That craftsman's name was Bezalel, and you can read about him in Exodus 31, where God called him to build the tabernacle in the desert. They'd been walking for a long time. He wouldn't have had that skill base, and God literally infused those capabilities into him. And the Bible describes it in this way. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. So God gave him wisdom and understanding and knowledge, all the things we've talked about in these sessions, that he gave these things to Bezalel. Craftsmanship, skill, wisdom, insight, and knowledge. To be able to do what he needed to do in the workplace. This was the first infilling of the Holy Spirit. God chose that this person, a craftsman, not a priest, not a king, a worker, a craftsman, a man who used his hands and tools to build things. And he honored him by the first recorded infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that's a pattern. And I think we've lost that, that these things are important. God has really got workplace higher up on his agenda than we have. We've separated these things and said, God, you stay in Sunday. I'll do Monday. But actually, that's not right. Monday is important. God is interested in our work, and he's demonstrated that by the first infilling of the Holy Spirit being a craftsman rather than a priest or a king. I had the privilege of running a company called Hagemeyer Brands Australia. We had distribution rights for Australia and New Zealand for consumer electronics and kitchen appliances, brands such as Smeg, Amiga, Blanco, JVC, Polaroid, a bunch of other brands. That company was in trouble. It had some interesting internal dynamics that weren't that healthy, and it was really struggling and going backwards. And I was asked to come in, transform that business, and ultimately take it to a transaction. At the end of that transaction, it got very complex because all those brands were represented overseas by many different, different brand owners, and we had to get agreement from all those brands to be able to sign off on the deal. So we were dealing with the US, with Hong Kong, with France, Germany, Italy, a whole bunch of different nations, different jurisdictions, very complex deal. And in the end, we got very close. It's two o'clock in the morning down here, down under, and it's you know daylight up in Paris where they were running the deal. But we were here and we were in the middle of all these negotiations. Everybody was in agreement. Everything was gonna get signed off and the Germans decided that they didn't wanna play the game anymore and that they weren't gonna sign off the deal. So we had a problem. Somebody needed to jump on a plane, go to Germany, and convince the Germans that this was a really good idea to do this deal. Being a pragmatist, I thought France was closer to Germany than Australia, so I suggested maybe someone from France go across the border. No, they said, why don't you get on a plane and fly to Germany? So I literally flew from Australia to Germany for lunch. And on the way, I'm saying, Lord, you know, what's going on? This is crazy. I'm, <laughs> I'm traveling to Germany for lunch here, but I need something from you. I need some insight into how to get these guys across the, across the line. And I needed something from him to really know that this was of him, that this deal would, needs to be done. Because uh, at the end of the deal, I would be out of a job, which, you know, occupational hazard for me, it's kind of what I do. But I really need to know from him and reassurance from him that this deal was, was the right thing to do. So I said, Lord, I gave a bold prayer. I said, Lord, I want to be able to walk out of that meeting with a signed contract from them. Very unlikely under the circumstances, very conservative company had already made their mind. And when I prayed that prayer, I felt the Lord just give me a little piece of logic. And I tucked it away. And in the midst of those negotiations, when I met with the Germans, put it on the table. Very simple thing, just put this logic on the table and the whole atmosphere in the meeting changed. They began to negotiate in a different way. Something shifted in the atmosphere. Just from that little revelation of the Lord, placed simply on the table, and that, that deal was done. And I literally walked out of that place with a signed contract for the, that deal, and that transaction took place, and another company was saved and moved on. The reason I tell you that story is, one, to give glory to God. He did that deal, not me. And secondly, 
It was my heart before the Lord, a worshipful heart, recognizing that work is worship before God, saying, what do you want? I surrender to you, your will be done. That he gave me the tools to be able to complete that transaction and get the job done. So God is interested in our work in the most ridiculously practical ways, from the small things to the big things. Every day, Monday to Friday, Monday matters to God. And as we work to worship and our heart position before him is one of surrender and obedience and giving glory to him, he will manifest himself within us and within our environment. We literally plug into heaven, bring heaven to earth and establish the kingdom of God where we work. I have enjoyed sharing with you today. I'm passionate about this stuff and it's, it seems so crazy to think about worship and work in the same context, but it's so true. And I'd love to take you on this journey and hopefully you'll pick up these things and apply them into your workplace. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to share with you today. Next session, we're gonna pull all this together. It's gonna to be the capstone session. I'm gonna give you some tools to be able to apply everything that you've learned over the last sessions. So looking forward to that, it's the practical nitty gritty of how do you take what you've learned and apply it into your work. Looking forward to that. God bless you as you worship him in your workplace.